Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Kagiyama, and I'd like to welcome everyone here to, to be your own hero. And uh, I was, Lori and I were talking, and uh, she was remarking about the background here. I was scrolling through different backgrounds, and, and I'd like, what I want to do is, is put up a different background for every video. And, and as soon as I saw this one, I said, that's the one. It's going to go uh, well with my blue shirt. So anyway, that, that's so much on that. But uh, we're filming this uh, on a Monday and just a beautiful, beautiful day here in Southern California and uh, absolutely wonderful, gorgeous, and so thankful to uh, be alive. And we're shooting part two uh, of our interview with Lori Lamasters from Arizona and the insight. And hopefully you've had a chance to see uh, part one. But if you haven't, you, we could just we're just going to pick up and and uh, start uh, discussing other topics as well. So what I'd like to do uh, as as far as uh, my health goes, uh, things are coming along very well. Um, I, I keep, I stretch, I exercise almost daily and uh, really work on things. And so that that's the way you do it. You've got to be dedicated to it and, and make it a priority in your life. Otherwise, uh, things will not get better. But I, I make it a priority every day. And even though it's a very, very busy Monday, I had a beautiful walk this morning and the sky was just crystal blue it was just gorgeous absolutely gorgeous so hopefully you're doing well and thank you for joining us at to be your own hero please subscribe like make a comment in the comment section if you like the video and at this time i'd like to bring back on uh just a wonderful human being wonderful person who i really really enjoy spending time with Lori masters from arizona Please introduce us, reintroduce yourself again and uh, share a little bit about yourself. Sure. Hey there, I'm Lori Lamasters with Care Partners Resource. And um, I was a caregiver for eight years to both of my parents, the last eight years of their lives. And I am a therapeutic journal writing instructor. I work with caregivers, helping them manage the challenges and uh, emotional struggles of caring for a loved one. We use a lot of therapeutic journal writing. We work on self-care. And um, I developed this business mostly because of the struggles that I went through when I was caring for my parents. And I know that most caregivers, um, whether you're caring for someone with uh, cancer or um, a stroke, or dementia, or a child that um, has mental or physical um, challenges. Caregivers all almost always have many of the same challenges. And so that's why I started my business. I, I, I've never been exposed prior to cancer with any of this. And, it, and it's opened up a brand new world. And, and to uh, see caregivers um, firsthand, like I had, and, and we were talking before the video, uh, my father was in a, well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, my father developed uh, dementia, and, and so he needed uh, pretty much full-time care uh, for the last several years of his life. And what my mother wanted to do was she wanted him at home. And so the plan at that time was to bring in uh, caregivers. And, uh, you know, she first at first tried to do it by herself. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, she's getting up there. And I just was just so blown away at her uh, dedication and love. Thank you for showing us that, Mom. My, by the way, my mom is is, is uh, watches every video and always makes a comment. And uh, I know That's she's awesome. gonna love. I know she's gonna love uh, watching these videos. Your number but, one fan. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so she at first tried to do it by herself, 
And then um, it, it just got to be too much because he needed so much help just doing regular, um, you know, taking a shower, going to the bathroom, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And so she first started with one caregiver and, and then, um, then she needed, you know, two caregivers, one at night. And mm -hmm. there were all kinds of uh, issues uh, with the night caregiver because the night caregiver kept falling asleep and, and uh, not paying attention and um, things like that. So there's a lot of issues um, uh, surrounding caregiving. And finally, what happened was after, after uh, quite a period of time, then uh, she decided to put him in a home, which was really, really good. And to see, I used to go visit him every week while I could before I got struck with cancer. And to see just what special human beings uh, these caregivers were, the ones that do care. Some don't, you know, some, no matter, no matter what, you know, it, it, you're not going to change them. But for the most part, mm -hmm. the compassion and, and the care and, and the concern and everything like that was just uh, amazing. And so if you could, you know, talk about some of the things um, that go, go along with caregiving and, and the decision to get a caregiver, uh, that would be great, Lori. So first of all, as you were talking, it occurred to me that I'll bet if you asked your mother if she felt that she was being a caregiver to your dad, the answer would be no. She was being his wife. She was caring for him, right? She was a wife who was caring for someone who, for a husband who could no longer care for himself. Okay. That's one that's beautiful, but it is also challenging because when you don't identify that, that what you're doing is caregiving, not that you are, your identity hasn't changed. You're not a, you know, you're still who you were, but, but your activities in a day are changing. And so that number one is a big problem for caregivers to identify that, that that is what they're doing. They are doing the duties of a caregiver. And um, when they recognize that, then they can start realizing that they can't do it all on their own. As someone progresses through the transition of the disease, no matter what the disease is, um, pieces of you start disappearing as you're caring for someone. You start taking on so much responsibility of their health, their needs, their, you know, everything is about them. And you little by little as a caregiver can begin to disappear and fade away. You're not doing the things you normally used to do. You're probably not seeing your family and grandkids as much or, or children as much as you normally would have. You're definitely not going to, you know, pleasurable things like out to dinner with friends and family and, and movies and all the things that, you know, we don't realize how very important they are in a day-to-day, -day, in our day-to-day -day lives. But when you're not doing them, it, it, you, it takes something away from you. And so it's really important when someone is caring for a loved one that they remember to take care of themselves above all. Um, because if you aren't taking care of yourself, you can't give good care to the person you're caring for. So kudos to your mom for recognizing that and, and bringing someone in to help, right? Then once you do that, people always think um, they have the misconception that, oh, you have a caregiver now, good, go, go to dinner, go to lunch, go get your nails done, go, you know, all these things. But really, sometimes bringing someone in to help you with that care, caregiving process can be more work, right? Because you're having to watch that person, make right. sure that they're doing what you've asked them to do. You have to train them. You have to teach them about your loved one. They may have the overall skill set, 
But everyone with dementia is different, just like every person is different. Everyone with a disease is different. So they have um, different needs. And for most people who are caring for a loved one, they're, they're, that is their world. And so they want to make sure that if they do let someone come into their world and take on that role a little bit of the time, that it's being done right. Right. So there's a lot of training involved. There's a lot of, um, you know, in my case, my mom couldn't speak. She was completely coherent. She understood everything. And she had ways of letting you know what she needed or wanted. But she couldn't use language as an as a source to, to communicate those things. So she would say, do, do, do. And in her brain, she was saying the words. In her brain, she thought she would tell me, I'm hungry or I need to eat. And so I would have to then say, mom, you just said do, do, do. So I don't know what that means. Is it about you? Is it about me? And she would always look at me like shocked and she'd say, I did. I'd say, yep, that's what she said, right? So we had this wonderful process and communication ability, um, but bringing a care, another person in to help with the care was really challenging for me because I was always worried they didn't understand her or they would ignore her or they would cry a couple times to figure out what she needed and then just be like, ah, you know, unimportant or whatever. And to me, every last little thing she wanted or needed was important. So those are some challenges that caregivers have when they're caring for someone with a dementia or um, a stroke or something like that, or maybe a cancer that has advanced to brain cancer or, or um, throat maybe, so they're not easily able to communicate their needs. Um, that makes it really difficult and challenging. And as you mentioned, Mark, you definitely takes a, a, a certain type of personality to take a job as a caregiver. You know, I I think when you're caring for a stranger, you're caring when you're caring for someone that you don't have an emotional connection to, wow, that is something else. You know, that but, but at some point it seems to me that you develop that connection, don't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But think about this, Mark. Think about it when you, when it is your job, right? And you think about that connection that you've developed after a year and you leave work on Friday and you come back on Monday and that person passed away over the weekend. Now, all of a sudden there's someone different in that bed and you're supposed to just start taking care of them, right? Nobody helps that professional caregiver with the emotional challenges of caring wow. for these people. Wow. You know, I'm going to go back to my mom. My mom was, it, it, it was the most amazing thing to watch because even when he was put in the home, uh, she went every single day and just dedicated. And, and probably and she, all day or most of the day. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so to watch that on a daily basis was, I, I didn't see it on a daily basis, but to hear about it yeah. on a daily basis was just uh, so incredible. And, uh, you know, they've always, my parents have always set great examples for all of us. And, you know, that was one of the greatest examples, yeah. you know, that I've seen. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. My um, grandchildren are now all in their 20s. And they were small when I was caring for my mom. But they remember it. And they saw the process, right? And they, in, in many ways, they even helped me a lot of times, you know, they'd help me with my mom's wheelchair or they'd run and go grab things and, you know, whatever, because I, I took them kind of regularly um, after school on Wednesdays and, and so on. And they, they were such a big help, but they, 
as by that example you're talking about, right? They learned that this is what you do for family. This is what families do for family. And they say now, um, they, they have bantered back and forth. No, I get grandma. No, I get grandma when the time comes, you know? And I'm like, nobody gets grandma. I have long-term care insurance. I get to, you know, I don't want, because having done it, I really don't want anyone else to have to go through that process and have to do it. I would not wish that on anyone, but I know that they will do it. There's no discussion because, wow. because it's family. It's, you know, when we are um, diverse cultures, you know, Hispanics, Asian, Black families, we have a tendency to live multi-generationally. We, you know, we care for each other. We, putting someone in a, in a facility isn't bad, but it is a absolute last resort is not something that's pretty common in our cultures. And so when that's the case, we teach each next generation that that's what family does, you know, but we don't teach them a healthier way to do it. <laughs> I, it's interesting you, you bring that up because my daughter, Lisa, she stepped up for me last summer when I really needed help and she spent two and a half months um, with me I, I mean as hard-headed as I am you know I, I mean she she is the one she's a great cook a fantastic cook and uh, so she cooked my meals and and that's when I was really really uh, you know I was down to 123 pounds and and I changed my diet and I added uh, animal protein and I started eating and I had, I had been a vegan for 10 years. And so uh, following the result, following the advice of, uh, from a friend of mine who's a nutritionist, he said I needed to add uh, animal protein in order to turn. I mean, I was just going downhill just yeah. as fast as can be because there was just so much going on and so he said you know if you want to turn it around and get better you're going to need to add animal protein in. and he was absolutely right and so she she didn't realize what she was getting into she's a fantastic <laughs> cook but my body was just so starved for protein and, and for these things which I hadn't had in so long I mean she was cooking massive meals you know five sometimes six meals big meals a day and she, she said uh that she excuse me uh that she was getting scared watching me <laughs> demolish <laughs> all this food you know but um you know, we have to listen to our bodies because our bodies, you know, tell us what it needs. And, you know, after eating these things that I hadn't eaten in so long, it tasted so good. It's tasted so delicious. And uh, so that was kind of the care. I didn't, I wanted to do as much as I could for myself. And so uh, what she did for me was she cooked for me. And I also, at that time, I couldn't reach my, uh, feet. And, and so I had, a, had to figure out different ways to wash my feet, but my feet were really dry from chemotherapy and mm -hmm. everything like that. And so she helped me to put lotion on my feet and, and she also helped me to do other things like start my YouTube channel here. <laughs> and thank you, Lisa, for helping me with that and, and my Caring Bridge site. So, um, do you think that she part of like I, I, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking she watched her grandmother take care of her grandfather, 
right? Yes. And so she, it's almost instinctive. It's, it's what we do, right? Dad needs help. How can I help him? I'm going to, I'm going to take care of this for him. Well, um, an, another amazing thing is, is she was coming from New York. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I, I, I didn't know what, what, I didn't want her to, you know, like stop everything, but she kept insisting, you know, Hey, I want to come out and, and help you. And I'm so, so glad and thankful yeah. that she did. You know, one thing that I think that people don't realize, and I guess I, in listening to you, I never recognize, I, I talk about this where around caregivers doing this to family members. I never thought about a patient doing this like to a caregiver, but, you know, giving care to someone, being able to show them love, being able to um, go through that process for them. It, it's a two-way street, right? Your daughter was able to help you. That made her feel good, right? And when, and when a patient doesn't allow people, they're, they're, you know, um, then we're, then in some ways we're sort of, um, taking something away from our loved ones. And I use this example a lot with caregivers. So I was terrible about wanting to do everything on my own. It was, I was just like immediately, this is my new life. I've got to learn how to do it. No, nobody bring food, nobody um, come in clean, nobody help with anything. And now in retrospect, I recognize that my siblings wanted to help. And, um, but because I was so stubborn and it had to be done a certain way and it just, you know, whatever. So I really didn't make it welcoming for them. And I didn't, wasn't, I didn't recognize that. And I cheated them a little bit out of the that time that they could have had with mom. I mean, they all came and they visited and they helped as much as they could and they did what they could. Um, but I think had I had the knowledge then that I have now, I would have done things very, very differently. I would have set up um, better opportunities for them to participate in the care because, you know, it it would enable them to feel the blessing that I felt in caring for my mom. You know? Uh, I mean, I, I talked to my, both my daughters and I are, are very close. And um, my younger daughter, uh, Tani, you know, she came out as much as she could, you know, but she's got a full-time job. She's a manager at a dental office and, and, but she, you know, she'd call every day and, and uh, we'd talk and, and uh, you know, I mean, she did everything that she possibly could. And I'm really thankful for her as well. I'm, sure. I, my kids are amazing. Absolutely. Just the calling you is emotional support, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, so I, I think there's such a powerful uh, bond that happens. Um, I, I mean, with, with my older daughter who stayed with me for two and a half months, Lisa, uh, it was such a great, great experience because I had the opportunity to get to know my adult daughter. Right. And, and that was priceless. Yeah. There's a connectivity that happens that I think people don't realize or recognize, you know, and um, there's, I mean, care. Caring for someone when they're when they're sick is so many levels. It's not just the act of caring for that person. It's it's all the different levels of of care. And you know, we can we it doesn't have to be a family member. It can be a friend. It can be a neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, 
we don't necessarily understand the how valuable it is to to bring something to someone when they're ill, right? It, it's like you made them some healthy meal and you bring it to them, or you um, take the time to call or send a card or go on to Caring Bridge and and write a message of love and support and prayers, and all of that is it all adds up and it is so so valuable to not only the person who's ill, but the person who's doing it. It's like, you know, it's like um, they say when you're having a really bad day, go volunteer somewhere, right? And it it makes you, um, makes you feel better. It gets you out of your head. You recognize you're not in the worst. There are people worse off than you kind of thing, you know? I think that for caring, for caregivers, it's important for them to um, get out of their own head sometimes and realize that um, it's okay to ask for help. In fact, it's necessary. It's necessary to take care of yourself while you're taking care of someone else. The statistics of people who don't outlive the person they're caring for are staggeringly high. And I think it has a lot to do with stress and the inability to manage that stress when they're caring for a loved one. So those are all really important things to remember. Wow, that this, this is such incredible information. So thank you so much for sharing so openly. It's, I, I really, really appreciate that. And I, and I know that we're gonna have a lot of people who comment about that and, and are thankful for that because it's something that you don't, you don't hear about. And, and it's something that, you know, as a society, you know, there, there's so much going on. You know, when we were growing up, you didn't hear about uh, people getting cancer like you do today. It, Not at all. It, it, and it, it's crazy. It, every, you know, being in the cancer community like I am, it, it's, it's like, all, I hear it all day long, you know, people from all over the world, you know, I, I'm in contact with, and, and it's staggering, absolutely staggering how much cancer is out there. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there's no playbook. There's mm -hmm. no, you know. Uh, no, you got to kind of do your own research. You got to advocate both you as the patient advocating for yourself and your loved one helping you, your caregiver advocating for you and doing a lot of the research, right? That's what you did. That's when you reached out to people who knew who, and you took that advice. Um, so important, not just to, be, not just to believe what you're told, even by healthcare professionals um, who mean well, who try who teach you what they know, but they don't know everything, right? They, right? they don't know it all. And so, you know, that's probably one of the biggest roles that caregivers do is is advocate and research. You know, um, very, very, very important. How how does one recognize when they need to bring in a caregiver. <laughs> yeah. You know, sometimes that's a community decision, right? Because um, it, it depends on the disease, number one, right? Um, but if your mental capacities are affected, a lot of times you don't recognize that you need help. And then it's like, how do you help someone who doesn't want your help? You know, there's that whole aspect of it. Um, so usually it's a, a family effort, a community decision um, that, or, or it's such a severe issue. Like in my mom's case, there was no question. The, the big question in my mom's case was, does she go into a home from the hospital or does she come home? and have someone there to take care of her. And because she couldn't, she also couldn't walk. She was a full transfer. So um, it wasn't a, a question of her, you know, 
being able to come home and take care of herself, nor was it a question of her being able to come home and my dad taking care of her because my dad was on dialysis. And he had gone from probably 230 pounds down to about 140 pounds from the dialysis. Wow. So um, he was pretty weak himself and um, uh, they just together needed assistance. And I'll never forget my dad looking at me and saying, please, please do something so she comes home. She won't get better if she, if we're not together, you know? Wow. And I I agreed, I mean, Truth of the matter is, I don't know that she ever really got better, but I definitely think she had a quality of life that was better than if we had made the decision to put her in into a facility. Wow. I, I mean, that's uh, the work that you did was amazing. And, uh, you know, I, I think both you and your parents got so much out of the experience. Um, there there's no question about that absolutely and that like you know the same with your mom right mm -hmm. it i'm sure it wasn't easy for her to bring caregivers into the home but at least he was still home mm -hmm. and then when it became so overwhelming so you know he, he needed help with all of his adls and uh, activities of daily living that's ADLs. um yeah I, <laughs> I knew that was gonna go on way over my head <laughs> you're like sure okay she needs help with that um you know but when when you get to a point when all of that is just so overwhelming it's hard to make that decision and um you have to respect it you have to respect that your mom you know, and I get that you do respect that, that, that she found a good place for your dad and, and she went, but then again, she didn't just trust that all these people were going to care for him and love him the way she loved him. Right. So she went every day to make sure that he was getting good care and make sure he knew she was there. She hadn't deserted him or whatever, you know, and um, those types of things are put a lot of burden and stress on caregivers, you know? So kudos to your mom for that. Oh, more than that, more than that. I, yeah. I mean, that was absolutely amazing. Absolutely incredible. And yeah. taught every, the whole family so much, you know, uh, about, you know, caring for somebody. So mm -hmm. that was um I can't, I, I'm speechless as far, which is hard to do, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that was an incredible, incredible thing. Um, I, I, I am just so mesmerized by, you know, our, our conversations and learning from you, uh, how complex and, and how uh, the thought process behind it and you, you know everybody takes um things like that for granted and there's nothing at all to take for granted because it's right. it's a very very difficult thing to be a caregiver mm -hmm. um and, and you have to be a certain kind of person i mean it's it's not like you just go in and punch and punch a time clock and and leave Right. I mean, there's not for everyone. Right. So much emotion involved in it because you're directly dealing with human beings. Right. And human beings um, have thoughts and and cares and all these different uh, things that make make up the human being, the person. So and, and so, I would imagine. What do you do in the instance where you get, you get a patient that's combative, who doesn't, uh, you know, want help or, you know, thinks that, you know, they're fine or, or, or things like that? How do you deal with that? Yeah, that's so hard. And it, you know, it, again, it depends on the, the challenge that they are dealing with, you know, like what, what does the parent have? Does the, is the parent 
got dementia? Is the parent actually functioning? I, I will go to something even smaller than what you're saying, but it sort of is the same thing. And that is when your aging parents should no longer be driving, right? Yeah. But they're not willing to agree. They don't see it themselves, right? And so in those cases, I usually recommend families to go to a professional and have the professional deliver the information, right? Because people will, like we talked about earlier, will listen to and believe a doctor or a lawyer or a, um, you know, the motor vehicle department over you. So if you have a loved one who is being, who is being, you know, stubborn about needing care or um, their inability to handle certain things, then, then I recommend contact their doctor, contact an attorney and have a, a, an elder care attorney and have them have a conversation with them about what are the legalities if you continue to drive and you hit someone, God forbid, kill someone, or, um, or you burn down your apartment. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, there are some very serious things that can happen, right? And one thing that I think people are mis, uh, misunderstand around um, privacy acts, especially when it comes to healthcare professionals, is that you are allowed to tell that doctor anything you want to tell them. They can't necessarily tell you about the care of your loved one unless you're on their medical power of attorney or the, your, your loved one has given them permission to talk to you. But you absolutely can say, hey, my dad is coming in on Wednesday for a doctor's appointment and here are some of my concerns. It would be really helpful if you looked into, if you watched for this and this and this, and could you talk to him about this? right? They, they can absolutely do that for you. And, and then when your dad hears concerns from the doctor, then they start thinking and they're more likely to listen. I actually went through um, not driving myself last, almost all of last year, I, I did, did not drive. And, and when you're used to driving and just going in that car and, and just taking off to not be able to do that is really, really difficult. You know? Really difficult. I, I never imagined. And, and so I had to get really, really creative. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I contacted the city and found different um, resources uh, so that people would pick me up. And, mm -hmm. and, and fortunately in my city, there was a really great, um, a service where you know I could you know if I gave them a day or two you know they would come pick me up and I got to know them and everything like that yeah. so it was it was really really cool so that helped but it's it's still not the same it's it's a really difficult situation Very when nice. the keys are taken away from you yeah and, and uh, in my case my right leg was so compromised that uh, you know my oncologist said, oh, you know, my bones are brittle and, you know, and so the family took it that, um, you know, there may be a, a, an accident or something that happens in front of me. And if I slam on the brakes, would my bone break? And then I'd cause an accident, and all that kind of thing. Right, right. Um, but I fought as hard as I could to get back uh, behind the wheel, which, you know, when I was... Uh, when I was ready to, I did, um, fortunately, and, and I've been driving, uh, ever since. And, and so now I, it, it's such a privilege driving, you know, as they say, driving is a privilege and, and it really is. And, um, so th there's so many complexities to, uh, you know, the patient and, and, uh, all the things about life that surrounds them mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and you know the families involved and and uh, all of that. So yeah, I, I totally resonate with everything that you're saying because I've lived it myself. Right, right. You know, and and, and what's crazy is 
and that's one of the things why I started my YouTube channel was I wanted to chronicle all of this. And, and you know, I go back now and um, I look back at the early videos and, and it's and it's just shocking to me the way I looked. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, when you're living it, you don't think about it. But like I talked to my daughters and they said, they said, it was like, they were so scared mm -hmm. you know, when they saw me. I wasn't scared because it was, you know, I was just living it. And, uh, but they, you know, from their perspective, they were like, wow, it was, it was frightening. Mm -hmm. and, uh, as, as the patient, you don't realize that. So yeah, it, it's, it's what a journey, what a crazy journey. Um, I wouldn't, I am thankful for that I went through the experience because it taught me how to fight, how to fight for everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to go through it again, <laughs> but, yeah. if I, but if I but had I think to. Truth, truth be told, we're all given a journey for a reason, right? So, right. so you would never have started this YouTube channel had mm -hmm. you not gone through your journey. I right. would never have started Care Partners Resource or written a book or any of that stuff had I not cared for my mom and dad. And I made a promise to them that they would not have gone through the health issues that they went through for no reason at all. And so we decided that that reason must be for me to help other caregivers. And that's why I do what I do. That's why you do what you do. Right? help people who, you know, with cancer or who are sick, give them hope, give them understanding that there, you know, are alternative ways to, to it that can coincide with Western medicine, but can help you get your strength back, be able to drive again, you know, be healthy, get, you know, all of that. So we all have a journey and we're living it. <laughs> absolutely absolutely and that's why it's so important you know I, I hope that everyone who watches this you know appreciates their health health I never understood you know when they used to say health is everything it really is everything I mean when you don't you don't realize that fully until you don't have your health and um uh, I mean, it, it's just such an amazing thing. And, um, you know, and as far as I'm concerned, I'll, I'll probably have some lingering issues from cancer that I'll have to deal with the rest of my life. That's okay. That is <laughs> right? totally okay. It's I am an okay so, trade off. Yes, absolutely. To, just to be alive and, and to, um, you know, be with family and friends. It, it's just, so amazing and i wouldn't wouldn't trade that for anything at all and so Lori, thank you thank you thank you once again for sharing your incredible knowledge about this particular thing that we call caregiving and uh, uh it, it it's i'm so honored i really and, and and i'm so thankful that we met because uh, i i mean I love to talk to you and, and I love hearing your experience. And with like yesterday before, uh, when we were talking, we were just talking about football and everything like that. And, and, and so that's, that's really great. You know? Yeah. My dad told me years ago, uh, he said, you know, life is for the living. So when you're alive, you got to live. You know, you can't worry about things that you can't control. Right. You can't, you know, if somebody passes away, you know, you mourn them, but then you have to move on and you have to live. And, and uh, so that's, that is so critical. Absolutely. So could you leave us with a parting thought? Sure. Um, let's see. You have to live every day. I love that. I really do love that. Um, and I would 
I would say that's true for caregivers too. So my parting thought for a caregiver is to um, remember that your needs and your desires, even when you're caring for someone are equally as important as the person you're caring for. And it's still important for you to live every day, live your dreams, live your um, hopes, and um, don't don't give up. Just keep going, you know, because you can do it. Thank you so much, Lori. I I mean, I absolutely love talking to you, and I could talk to you for days, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, you know just to everyone out there, you know, make somebody else's day, uh, give them a smile, say hello to them. You know, even if it's at the grocery store or, or your postman or a neighbor, um, give them a smile, try to make, uh, uh, you don't know what that other person is going through. You know, uh, you, we're not mind readers. And, and so just do the best you can to spread positivity and, and being positive because this, our world needs it. Our world really, really needs people who are positive because it's, it's, this is the craziest times I think in our lifetime. I don't think there's any question about it. And the only way our world is going to get better is if we help to make it better. So let's all of us pitch in, do our share. Uh, try to make somebody else's day. Thank you so much for joining us at To Be Your Own Hero. Make the most out of every single day. Every single day is an incredible gift. And, and if you look at it, you know, so many people, it, oh, it's Monday or it's Tuesday or oh, I can't wait for Friday. Make the most of every day that you open your eyes and have the experience of another day. So make the most of it, make the most out of every breath, and we will see you next time on To Be Your Own Hero. Thank you very much.